things to think about. Um, and so with uh, any luck here, um, we can switch over to our panel discussion. Uh, and the panel panelists are the three speakers, um, Jane, Morgan, and Allison, and uh also Sied, if he is here he was called away so i'm not sure if he's back with us he is here he's yes away. excellent yeah. yes i'm I, i'm here sorry i have been juggling between different oh, meetings but uh, i'm back yeah uh excellent so uh welcome Sied. um thank you uh just a quick introduction Sied. uh you're a uh you're um uh, leading up, I guess, um, the agent-based modeling and some nice work at York. Uh, so you're you're established at York University, um, but you also have a lot of uh, in-host expertise. I know that uh, I didn't see on your biography anywhere, um, so you you fit right in with this panel. Um, okay. And so I I will uh, I got to apologize a bit. My computer crashed, so I lost a little bit of the chat. But there are a few. Uh, I'm going to pick off a few questions for you uh, that I think lead into some nice discussion. Um, the first one I see is from uh, Miriam Showman. Uh, she wants to know, uh, I think this is specifically directed at Jane, but there's some more interesting discussion points in here. Recommend When would you recommend children aged 12 to 17 be eligible for boosters? Uh, and maybe uh, I'll let Jane start, yeah. Sure. So uh, a lot of 12 to 17 year olds got their second doses, I guess, August, August to now. Um, and so the modeling that we have on booster doses would, would suggest that they wait a little bit longer uh, to get their second dose. Uh, if we were looking at Delta and Alpha variants with Omicron, I'm just not sure. We're still in the process of modifying our models to look at um, uh, vaccine escape. And I'm just not sure how, how clear it is in, in that specific age group, given that their doses were um, quite recent compared to the rest of the population. So I'm not sure if uh, Allison has also some answer to that question. I don't, but I have an added question for you, Jane, which is that I'm not sure I've seen antibody measurements in, in that really young group of people to know. I, I would expect them to have slower waning than the rest of us. And so I, 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 I'm sure they must be somewhere, but I haven't seen them to know because I think that would be a, a helpful prediction as well. I think one of the other reasons for hesitating about boosters in that group, although uh, Nancy is supposed to tell us something shortly, um, is uh, that of course they, they are much less likely to have severe infections. So um, it doesn't, them needing third doses doesn't matter as much for them as individuals as it does for some of us who are a trifle older. Yeah, I agree totally. And uh, that's a good question about the antibody data. We do have some, but I have to go back and check to see um, some of the particulars in that. I know there are some large scale studies um, led by some immunologists at our hospital, which is a pediatric hospital. So I would expect that if it's not out already, it'll be out quite soon. You're muted, James. James, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, go ahead, Sid. Here. Oh, um, well, I don't have a lot to add here. I think I agree with the panel, but I would say this. I think one issue that we have is that, you know, when we think about when to vaccinate, if vaccine is recommended and we have the capacity, we should vaccinate. Why not? I mean, the, the question is when we should vaccinate, 
obviously, you know, it is a very difficult question because there's a wide spectrum of individuals, even in that age category. There are individuals that are even compromised. There are kids that need potentially booster because their immunity could decline significantly due to underlying conditions they have. And we know that a lot of different communities already discussing this. I mean, in, in population of uh, Israel, adults are getting fourth dose and potentially children starting to get the fourth dose, never mind that, you know, talking about the third dose. But in Canada, we were talking about whether we should give the third dose or not. My, my sense is that vaccination is always a good thing. It's, it's a tool to reduce infection, mainly severity of the disease and hospitalization and risk of severe outcomes. There are some emerging evidence, and this is really the critical part, which I think, um, Nate, if I'm not mistaken, Nate mentioned some of it at the very beginning of the meeting today. There are some emerging evidence that vaccination reduces the risk of long COVID. And if kids are, according to what CDC is publishing now, are becoming susceptible or essentially vulnerable to some of the long COVID issues that could increase, could be a, you know, a problem for the lifetime and could increase cost of treatment and potentially be a very devastating situation for a long time in healthcare system. I think vaccination, emerging evidence is that vaccination reduces the risk of long COVID. So my sense is that if we have the approval and we have the capacity and resources to do it, why not? The question is whether we should, you know, focus on it or not, depending on there are other needs in the population. Yes, that's a very relevant question. But if we have the resources and, and vaccine available and is approved, we should do it to reduce the risk of long COVID and other potential problem down the road. I guess there's a couple more things too that we can think about that build on uh, what Syed is saying. So uh, one thing is uh, our vaccination program was quite different from Israel's in, in the fact that we, we spread our doses out quite a bit. Um, and so no one, I, I don't think I was saying don't vaccinate, but I mean, the booster dose could be a longer term time down the road, but also for immunocompromised individuals, certainly, uh, that's up to their, their position too. And I know lots of people who are immunocompromised in that younger age group getting that, that third dose. But there's also this question that if uh, individuals are getting, and I think Allison talked a little bit about this, that if an individual gets vaccinated and then they say get Omicron, there are some things that we need to understand a little bit more about too, such that you know if someone is getting a severe infection, a, se a severe outcome from Omicron, then we might want to wait to vaccinate that individual because the vaccine might then elicit uh, the wrong type of response that we want in that person as well. Um, so uh, just some things to think about. And then another thing is just, you know, the cost of the vaccine, whereas uh, if we can save some doses and send them to another country, then that maybe that would help overall globally as well. So just some things to think about. I think one of the other things that people are a little worried about with additional doses of vaccine is whether with the, if this virus continues evolving, whether we will get into the trouble with original antigenic sin and whether if we give too many doses that are misdirected at, at something other than new variants, um, that might actually interfere with our response to those new variants. I, you know, that is, that, that's inconsistent and it seems unlikely to me to be a major problem in the longer term. Um, but I, I, I think it's, it's playing into us trying to, trying to make sure we get the best protection for people with the least number of doses. And there's the issue of vaccine 
equity, I think, too, which is something that is beyond the scope, but that would, you know, di distributing doses around the world for more, in like, larger protection is also an important consideration. But I also agree with what everyone said. Yeah, it's a nice, uh, lots of aspects to that question, lots of uh, issues um, on all levels. Um, so I think that there's also a question from Jerry Dances um, that's somewhat related and probably has some similar issues, but might be a, a bit simpler to address. Um, uh, vitamin D deficiency correlates with bad COVID. Um, and they, he's asking about models, whether the models include Sorry, I have to keep turning my head. Um, building up immunity. So the interesting question of uh, prior immunity and, and you know digging down into related immunity from other aspects and other ways to build up immunity to, uh, I guess, assist with the vaccines. Uh, who wants to field that one? Start. So we've included comorbidities as uh, a risk in our epi model. That's, a, that's for immunity as well. Um, and so if vitamin D is incorporated into the comorbidity uh, percentage that's pushing you to more uh, severe infection, then it would be incorporated into our model. Uh, in in-host modeling, I haven't thought about incorporating any effects of vitamin D. I don't know if Morgan, you have. Uh, we haven't, but we think about other immunocompromised like cancer patients and things like that. But yeah, no, not not vitamin D explicitly. Well, the the difference with with vitamin D deficiency is that it it, it can be treated, and it, England and Scotland have sent out bottles of vitamin D to everybody they consider at risk. I, I, I think the reason, one of the reasons that we haven't chose to do it in Canada is if you look at the levels of vitamin D you have to have um, to be at significantly greater risk, they're not uncommon in some parts of the world, but they're distinctly uncommon in serous surveys in Canadians, okay? It's a function of having vitamin D in your milk and your bread and who knows what else we've been adding vitamin D to. Um, so it's, it's, it, it would make sense in modeling in some countries, I think, but I'm not sure it contributes enough to modeling in Canada or that there's enough vitamin D deficiency at a population level for it to be a, an overall public health intervention, despite, as you point out, it being you know, safe um, and, and helpful to people with significant deficiencies. Uh, Sid, did you have any, anything you want to add there? Oh, your, your mute's on, I think. Oh, sorry, um, this is something I'm trying to avoid adding anything to it because <laughs> I, I, I could be wrong because I'm not sure if, uh, well, let's leave it at that. Uh, I mean, <laughs> something that I could say something wrong and vitamin D, um, yeah, I would prefer to get vaccine rather than vitamin D myself. <laughs> Those are not two separate, it's not a dichotomy. Yeah, I, yeah. Okay. Um, and so uh, I think everyone can see, um, is it everyone? Yeah, Nate's uh, question in the chat. So I'll just, I'll just paraphrase it into, um, uh, starting a discussion on uh, which some of the uh, 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 Morgan, um, I think some of your modeling led into that the the issue of the long longer term dynamics post infection and Jane as well and, and long COVID um, and maybe Morgan, did you want to say something on? Particularly in the inflammatory context, because there's many subtypes of long COVID, but this is you know specifically in the inflammatory um, avenue. Yeah, so we're um, in addition to what I talked about today, 
where we can do longer term predictions. We also work um, with Paul Macklin, who's leading a consortium um, modeling an agent based model of uh, lung tissue. Um, which has basically the same components of the immune model. We're involved in the immune modeling part of it, basically the same group that I that I talked about. Um, so yes, I mean, with respect to inflammation over time and, and the dynamics of inflammation and, and the percentage of damage and, and these kinds of markers, uh, yes, that, that, that our models could, could do that. In terms of other things in, that might go together with the long COVID and like CSF, you know, virus and CSF and things like that, obviously our, our model doesn't. Um, and, uh, but in, that's kind of the idea that we would like to do is that we have now this kind of way that um, we can look at acute and long-term responses, including for example, you know, memory responses over time and these kinds of things. Um, and then looking at, you know, if you gave a dose of a vaccine, which could, does sometimes look like it might um, help with some of the COVID, uh, long COVID symptoms, you know, what would you expect in terms of the, the response of all these immune players? So I think that's an important question to think about. Thanks so much. Uh, I just add that I haven't done any modeling of this uh, yet, but I would like to, and there's a lot of data from uh, Canadian studies that are coming in uh, where they look at long COVID in and in adults and in children. So there'll be a lot more information that we can gain from these studies and through modeling of that data. And maybe I'll just uh, note as a, as a, but a bit as a plug, but as um, uh, a sign of the times, like our province uh, with my involvement as one of the three uh, co-PIs is, is uh, launching a registry for long COVID, which includes serological testing as part of it. So there's the biological component plus the longitudinal modeling in this case with our smartphone system. So, you know, that, that may end up um, capturing uh, additional understanding of the dynamics, particularly if there were follow-up uh, serology done or something. Yeah, Th thanks. Thanks so much for the comment. So maybe I, I just add to what uh, Jane and Morgan was saying. Um, so long COVID is, is, a, is a very critical component of this pandemic dynamics, uh, but there are also some issues emerging right now. So in terms of modeling, um, we haven't done anything related to COVID-19, to long COVID, but uh, when we try to add any of the components of long COVID into modeling, we realize that published studies are all over the map. Definition of long COVID and symptoms are very different in different studies. Duration of follow-up is very different. And, you know, is not quite clear in terms of age groups, in terms of population, in terms of whether individuals who had long COVID and specific symptoms, whether they were healthy or previously infected, this is reinfection or whether uh, they had uh, comorbidities and so on. So there are a lot of uh, confusion on that. So we decided to actually, rather than going about modeling the situation, to do a systematic review first, understand what is going on really in that uh, context. So uh, we are almost at the last stage of the systematic review, and we are getting a good understanding of the landscape of uh, long COVID in terms of the age groups, in terms of duration of different symptoms um, and who are individuals that are experiencing different symptoms and duration and what are the long-term consequences of any of those uh, uh, long COVID symptoms. So um, I should be able hopefully in the next couple of months to share some of the results of the study. Uh, but um, I think this was, this is probably the first step before we actually start modeling to get a sense of some of the parameters that could be useful for modeling. 
agreed with the variegated character of, of the literature. Although I, I will note that, um, you know, there's a, a good five to 10 other reviews that have come out, some of them systematic reviews on particular areas, but not oriented towards modeling, you know, specifically, right. which, which I think yours would be. So yeah, thanks. That's very helpful. Um, okay, uh, so uh, just skimming through some of the other questions and uh, maybe uh, there's a few questions about um, data. So maybe lump that into a discussion. It kind of follows a little bit from what uh, Sia, you were just saying, I think. Um, but one is a question about uh, what, what the data available, sorry, specifically for Omicron. Um, but uh, I think behind that and some of these other questions, um, just some general comments on the uh, in-host data, um, immunization data, and, and building up the population level models. Um, so always we want more data. <laughs> and data is hard, data is hard to find, or if some people have data, it also can be hard to share. Um, but we are always getting a new, even if it's small bits of data, small data sets, it's still informative. Um, and so some things that we're looking for are say, um, if we're looking at sero surveys, we're looking at um, different antibodies that are for anti-N versus anti-S. So if you have anti-N antibody measurement, we know that you're infected. Um, we can look at different levels of anti-S to see over time, say if you're a blood donor, then we might be able to get that um, uh, regular information from you so that we can see if, you're, uh, if your anti-S level is increasing or decreasing over time and what that means, given that we know maybe there was a wave of infection in there, maybe you had an asymptomatic infection. Um, we're looking for certainly uh, anything that has information on T cells. Um, uh, anything that has to do with that can help us look at severity of infection. And with Omicron, uh, these things are difficult to, to also get from a lot of uh, individuals because we don't, uh, we've had to decrease testing just because of, um, you know, testing capacity uh, in some of our provinces. And so that also means that we'll be getting less information about people who are mildly infected, uh, especially that ascertainment rate. And so uh, any data is good data. Um, even if it's bad data, we can try to clean the data <laughs> to see if it can help inform our models. So uh, I'll stop there. I mean, I would um, just echo what Jane said. We, uh, I'm lucky to be, uh, it, it can be hard sometimes like Jane mentioned to share data because sometimes it's obviously not our data. So that's one, one issue I would say, but um, it, uh, we're lucky to be situated within the hospital network in Montreal. And so we get, uh, we, we work with clinicians who are in the field collecting data, um, but things like memory cell generation and subsets and, uh, um, you know, but particularly longitudinal sampling that can be difficult to do experimentally, but or clinically, but uh, is very helpful. Um, and obviously, because we also think about evolutionary pressures on the uh, during viral evolution, the sharing of viral sequences that has gone on in the pandemic has been, um, you know, so important and really, really helpful. So, um, yeah, there's no bad data, but it can be a pain to get data sometimes, but we're always very um, thankful when we do get it. Allison, did you have um, anything to add to that from the uh, sort of the non-modeling perspective of, I guess, getting the data, how, how uh, some of the issues? I don't, you know, I, I, I think is there, there's lots and lots of data on Omicron that is coming as, as quickly as people can make it come. At the same time, it's a, you know, the, the loss of 
the loss of straight testing data has mm. been been particularly hard on population modelers and, and people who are trying to forecast what's going forward. But it's it's a challenge for everybody, and and it's it's you know it's just one of those things that can't be helped. Um, but I think the, you know the, the next the next six weeks will just be this mass of data um, on, on on Omicron, and I, you you kind of have to take it where you can get it from. You know it. it um, there are places in the world where everybody's had at least one infection by now, so you can't find out what's happening to unvaccinated people at all. And there are places in the world like Canada where there's not much point in trying to study people who've been vaccinated and infected because there's not enough of them yet uh, to do it. So it's really a, um, uh, it, 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 I, I think the amount of data sharing that we have is stunning relative to what we've been able to do, but there's still sort of big gaps in, in, in how well we can do. I also see there's a there's a question on, on modeling for new variants, and I just want to stick my nose in here about the fact that, you, you know, I think one of the weaknesses of the Canadian response is that we haven't had a specific effort on virology. You know, we don't have a we, we don't have a network that is largely virologists working on things. And so we 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 don't have nearly as much strength in our modeling of what might happen um, to the virus as we do in, in many other aspects of our modeling. I think we've done amazingly well across Canada in, in all sorts of mathematical modeling, but um, that's, a, that, that's a gap, I think, in our approach um, to the pandemic at the moment. I think um, Guillaume Bourque at McGill is, is running a large now uh, viral, uh, or consortium of, of viral, I don't, not, I don't know if it's necessarily all virologists, but population genesis and like people looking at viral sequences, but you're right that it it came late in yeah. with respect to other to other countries. And and just to follow up with that, it can be very difficult also to use in-host models to now look at, at within host pressures to then um, predict new variants because there's all kinds of uh, complications when you're thinking from the individual to a population level and uh, on immune pressures. Um, but I, I just to respond to somebody who had asked the question, I think people are thinking about it, but it's it's technically complex and potentially not quite feasible. So, well, we, it might also be that we're it's it's not human hosts that variants are going to come from, right? Uh, it's um, I, I I I think the um, it, it it's it's tempting to look at what happened with Omicron and say, it's logical that this could have happened in an immunosuppressed human being, and there are lots of them in South Africa. But it's equally possible that it some, was, was some evolution in animals you know, for some period of time that leaked back into human hosts, right? I, you know, I think we, I, I, there, there are lots of other mammals that get infected with SARS-CoV-2 that I think we need to be worrying about. And again, I, I, I think there's some people in Canada doing really nice work, but we were we were maybe a little bit on the slow side to, to well, I, I think globally, we were a little bit on the slow side to pick up the one health aspects of SARS-CoV-2 and for good reason, okay? It's not like we didn't have other things to focus on, but um, I, I, I think the, um, uh, the the one health is is a critically important piece of, of what we're doing with looking at evolution of virus. I'll build on that and say that there is a new funded network that's specifically for One Health modeling. Um, so that's a good thing. I'll also say that in the beginning of the pandemic, I did start to model virus evolution. And when we were looking at the, uh, the mutation rate of the virus, it just was so slow that some people are like, why are you even focusing on that? And so I changed. <laughs> I changed to something else. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, there's always, maybe there are pockets that we need to identify in the beginning of a pandemic uh, that will definitely, that we need to make sure we're looking at. And I hope that the modeling networks have been funded by NSERC are, are certainly thinking what these pockets are so that we're ready for the next one. Yeah, I would say if we take our model with the, uh, and implement kind of like a quasi species approach like you are probably doing Jane with and supplemented by the estimates from Julie Hussein's lab. 
uh, within a normal acute infection time course. You don't really see a lot of emerging mutants like the, the infected strain is the one that will potentially be passed. And so I think that it's either, as Allison said, um, a story from immunosuppressed or compromised people who can have persistent infection. And I think that there's recently been some idea of persistent infection in gut tissue, but um, it's also um, equally likely that you know, there are animal hosts that are, are coexisting with humans and, and there's things passing back. So, oops. So there's also the question of, of adverse events and, and, how, and how this should, should play out uh, in, in deciding, say, when to give boosters or not. You know, and especially for, actually, I'd say for, for 15 year old boys who have been, who have been <laughs> getting um, um, heart attacks, you know, on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the sports field. Um, as well as as well as the the, the basic Pfizer trial uh, for their vaccine, so there was there were seventeen of the vaccinated uh, um, people who who died, and there were twenty five. Sorry, there were seventeen of the placebo group who died total, and. And there were 25 of the vaccinated group who died. Uh, this is looking at all causes of all causes of deaths, not just the the deaths from from COVID. So I'm not sure what the question is here. Are you trying to say that vaccine could have could have has, has, more, more harm, it, it would be harmful, or it would have someone who gets infection has has a better chance of uh, avoiding severe outcomes compared to someone who is vaccinated. Is it is that the? Uh, I'm saying that the, the vaccines are generating adverse effects, and it's something uh, that's that, that's worth calculating. Okay, but but the, yeah, that 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 may be the case, and they they go through clinical trials to actually understand that. But I think if you look at the overall outcomes of clinical trials, the risk of adverse events happening after infection without vaccination is orders of magnitudes higher than the risk of adverse events after vaccination. So, so I think it, if you look at it in this context, well, uh, no I, question that vaccine. I, I, yeah, but that, that leaves out the, 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 the people who, who do not get COVID, but just get the vaccine and have a, a, an adverse effect. So, so is not getting COVID an option in the longer term? It is an option. It's kind of a, just a general question to the panel on, on how this is going to play out in the longer term. I mean, you can get COVID and, and if you survive, that, that's a big if, I'll put it in quotes for you, sure, that's a good strategy. Uh, but uh, you're gonna look at the cost of that uh, for healthcare system, Never mind the long COVID and all the possible outcomes of that that you would transmit to somebody who would be vulnerable to severe outcomes and would get probably get hospitalized and would probably die. I think that there are a number of sequence of events after someone gets infected that often is brushed under the rock, uh, looking at the individual level perspective of, oh, if I get infection, then I should be okay. And therefore I don't need vaccine. But what about the rest of the dynamics here? I think I'll, instead of talking about COVID, I'll, I'll just have an example for influenza. So if an individual uh, has an influenza infection, that individual, it's, it's possible for them 
to have a heart attack many, many months later after they've resolved infection. Um, and it's been shown that if the individual has the influenza vaccine and then get infected um, and resolves the infection, they have a much lower probability of having uh, a heart attack many months later. And so um, I think we're, we're focusing a lot on the short-term effects of vaccination and the adverse outcomes of getting a vaccine in the short term. But in the long run, um, you, you, you can start to see some of these additional benefits of vaccination as well, uh, and certainly for flu. For COVID, uh, there's still a lot of studying going on where we need to understand some of these things. So maybe, uh, so I don't think we're going to get through, we've got about 10 minutes left. I don't think we're going to get through all the uh, questions and nice discussion points that are appearing in the chat. Um, uh, maybe I'll uh, direct one piece to Sied, but then just uh, um, Morgan, Jane, Allison, and Sied, uh, feel free to uh, just pick out some of the interesting ones you see if you want to focus on um, or, or interesting comments you want to say that you didn't see in the chat. Um, but Sied, I think uh, I did see Jin Hong was asking something about uh, if you could say something about your experience with modeling in the USA and specifically the access to data and policy. Um, sure. Um, I, I, I also got an email from Jin Hong on the um, a spacing between vaccine doses, which uh, was uh, part of the policy in Canada very early uh, in the pandemic because of the, potentially because of the shortage of vac vaccine supply, uh, but also for many other reasons possibly. Um, so most of my work has been largely in US context. Um, um, very few study I did in, you know, use modeling for in Canada and using Canadian data for uh, well for for a number of reasons one of them is that I didn't have direct access to data in 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 Canada but I have direct ac access to US data and in many health departments so I have agreements with them and they send you know the line level data that I need for modeling so I you know, sometimes it's, uh, it's hard to look at pre-processed data uh, and feed them into the model. Like uh, in Canada, a lot of data is, is public similar to US, but case counts for, you know, for my modeling is one of the piece that is not necessarily accurate because of a lot of reason that panel already mentioned, lack of testing or professional testing because we, we target towards mostly symptomatic cases or we don't have access to, you know, a lot of hospitalization data or a specific type of it within hospital in terms of ICU age group, comorbidities and so on. But, but this type of uh, data, I was kind of lucky to be in a group that has a lot of agreements with different health departments in the in the United States, and uh, we therefore get um, significant data collected without pre-processing, and we are able to get information that we think is useful for modeling by analyzing the data ourselves and feeding into the model. At the same time, there are and I think this is something that is being done in Canada, but not necessarily directly through involvement of all modelers that are conducting mo modeling in Canada. Something that US does, it, and it's interesting, is that they bring modelers to the table, sitting around the table with public health decision makers. Like if I was doing a modeling for you know, in the context, context of Canada and we have some really good questions, I would like to be, you know, it, around the table with Theresa Tam, with Allison, with someone else from BC and Halifax and, and you know, Manitoba, that they're making decisions about these things rather than sending a question 
and saying, okay, can you go and do the modeling, come back, give me the results? No, I want to be essentially these guys to be involved in the process and sit around the table and say, what is the exact question? What, what, what is your need? What are you trying to get at it? What, what are your assumptions? Because, you know, proposing question is one thing, but knowing the context of it and the assumptions and the lying assumption, the capacity of the healthcare system, what, what they want to do, what is the objective of any policy they want to implement is another thing that could dramatically change the modeling assumptions and formulation of modeling in general. And this is what is what I see on, you know, um, almost daily meetings that we have with can, uh, you know, US partners that they bring up a lot of different issues and the models is evolving almost on daily basis with new parameters, new structure and so on. So um, it helps significantly in terms of literature review because you get up to speed in terms of uh, new evidence and uh, information coming out from different population, different um, research groups. That helps a lot. Um, and in terms of moving forward, then tasks are distributed across different, you know, nodes and different individuals. And you, you formulate things very efficiently and you get the results very rapidly. I think Canada is in the right directions, but a lot of it at this point is that um, I still see modeling in Canada being done a little bit in turn in the vacuum that, okay, we think that the feeling is that we need to do this at this point and what are the questions that we can answer, right? Rather than what is the real need of public health? Um, but I think there has been with, with these networks that have been established, especially mathematics for public health, which is, I think is, I would say globally is one of the largest and best teams ever made. Um, we are moving in the right direction. And, and I think the outcome, the best outcome is yet to come, probably in, in, in the year or two in terms of training and getting to a stage that the modeling in Canada could potentially lead um, globally. So that, that's what I wanted to say, but, um, but I think overall, I learned a lot from experience of working with uh, US colleagues and international um, that helps me you know, collaborate with my uh, Canadian partners. We have about uh, three or four minutes left, I think. So maybe just in, in closing, I'll just go uh, give all our panelists a chance to just make some closing comments in a minute or two each. Uh, Alison, did you want to say anything in closing or last comments? I don't think so, other than what a pleasure has been as an outsider to have watched the modeling collaborations. I, I have a, a pretty narrow window on, on what's happening in Ontario most of the time, but it's been a, it, it's, it's, it's just been a stunning level of collaboration that has been enormously helpful um, in, in managing the pandemic and, and guiding public health decisions. And um, it's, it's, it's all of you guys working together um, as far as I can tell. So this is, this is a personal thank you for Allison for um, getting us through this and, and for keeping up the work. Thanks. Um, Morgan, did you want to make any more final comments? I was hoping you'd choose me after Jane so I could just say yes, I, or say I didn't just say <laughs> I agree with what they said. Uh, I think I would echo what Allison said, which is that uh, it, it's always, it can be sometimes difficult for uh, people in our field to make uh, form collaborations with other people. And when you have them, they're so precious and you work on them for, I hope, the rest of my career. Um, but in this, uh, during the pandemic, I've um, started a lot of new collaborations with other modelers and also clinicians and experimentalists that are really, really valuable 
and really important. And so it's thanks to people like Allison who are really open um, to sharing data and also sharing their expertise. And I think that that's uh, of most importance here. And of course, I'm really excited that, you know, I'm working closer with James and Jane and everyone else in the within host community in, in Canada, which um, I think it's been nice to, to have meetings all together so that we can discuss things um, and know what everyone else is working on, not in a competitive way, but in a, you know, let's learn from each other way. Uh, Jane or Syed, who wants to? Syed, go ahead. Um, on the unmute. Sure. I, I, I think all the good things are already said. Well, one <laughs> thing that I would add here is that, you know, pandemics and emerging diseases always bring misery to human population. But one good thing that comes out of these emerging diseases is that they always stimulate research and science and collaboration. And, and this is probably the best outcome of any pandemic. Um, and, um, um, and I live it at that. So I think we, we are collaborating and we are making progress in research and science. And that's, that's the best part of this pandemic. Uh, I think the one thing I'll add into what everyone has said uh, is I'm a lifelong learner and I have really enjoyed all of the meetings and small group meetings, workshops, conferences, working with um, people in the COVID immunity task force over the, over the pandemic, uh, just learning more and more and more um, so that we can um, advance in host modeling uh, and, and what it's, what's, how we're using in host modeling in Canada, I think. We can advance that with all these new collaborations and, and no, networks that we have so that we can understand more about the underlying biology of an infectious disease so that we don't need to in the future rely so much on epidemic models. I think in-host modeling uh, really needs to be a, a key right in there. Great. So I uh, just want to uh, close by thanking um, Morgan Jane and Allison for the excellent talks and uh, Sied as well and all four of you for the uh, excellent discussion. Um, and there's still lots of interesting points in the chat that we didn't get to. So I, uh, all kinds of things to 